My name is Brenda, and welcome to Horrifying History, where you will hear about the unexplained, paranormal, and supernatural happenings that have stained the pages of history. A beautiful and famous actress takes some time off with her husband and an actor friend. Soon afterwards, she is dead. Did she drown like many people believe, or did she lose her life at the hands of another? Welcome to bonus episode 34, The Mysterious Death of Natalie Wood. Many of those who were in Natalie Wood's life in her early years thought that she was destined to be a star. Her parents, Nikolai and Maria, met while Maria was still married to her first husband, and the couple got married four months before her birth in San Francisco, California, in the United States. After Natalie's birth on July 20, 1938, Maria and Nikolai did not plan for their daughter to become a massive film star, but she started down this road after they bought a house in Santa Rosa, California in 1942. It was here that young Natalie was noticed by members of a film crew who were shooting a movie in the downtown area. After noticing the child's beauty and grace, they mentioned to her parents that perhaps they should consider pursuing an acting career for their child. By the age of four years old, Natalie landed her first film role. It was a small part in the 1943 film called Happy Land, and it was filming in Santa Rosa. Despite the fact that her scene was only about 15 seconds long, she was noticed by the film's director, Irving Pitchell. But little Natalie did not charm the director on her own. In later years, Natalie would say in multiple interviews that it was her mother Maria that orchestrated Irving and Natalie's introduction, and her mother had coached her in how to gain this man's interest. It was her mother who told her to make Mr. Pitchell love you, which resulted in Irving keeping in touch with the Woods family for the next two years, telling them when other roles that would be suitable would pop up. One day, Irving called Maria asking her to bring Natalie to Los Angeles for a screen test. Maria was so excited about this opportunity that she wanted to pack up the entire family and move there, but Nikolai didn't want this at all. He soon bent to Maria's ambition to make Natalie a superstar, and soon after they arrived to their new home, Natalie got the role that she auditioned for. In the 1946 movie called Tomorrow is Forever, Natalie charmed audiences in her role as a post-World War II German orphan opposite the star of the movie, Orson Welles. He would later say that Natalie was a born professional and was so good that she was terrifying. Perhaps that had something to do with her mother Maria. When Natalie could not cry on cue, her mother tore apart a butterfly in pieces in front of her to make her sob on camera. Soon, audiences couldn't get enough of the dark-haired, doe-eyed little girl. In 1947, she won over fans in her first starring role in the Christmas classic, Miracle on 34th Street. It was this movie that made Maria's dreams come true. Her daughter was now a star on the silver screen. By the age of 16, Natalie was a commodity in Hollywood. It was here she started working on one of her most famous films, Rebel Without a Cause. She starred as the girlfriend of a troubled outsider that was played by movie heartthrob James Dean. She earned her very first Academy Award nomination for that role, but with the good roles came the bad. Since she was under contract with her movie studio, she was, at times, forced into roles she didn't want to do. She was also pressured heavily by her mother to take any role that she could fit into her schedule. But even with those bad roles came the good. In 1961, she starred opposite Warren Beatty in the classic Splendor in the Grass and starred in West Side Story. In 1962, she played in a film that mirrored her own life, Gypsy. In this film, Rosalind Russell co-starred with Natalie as a domineering stage mother who pushed her daughter into performing. So now at this point of her life, Natalie was getting a lot of press for her acting roles, but she also was getting a lot of attention due to her personal life. She was involved in many relationships, both in public and in secret with her co-stars, other movie stars, and her colleagues. But when the press heard that the now 18-year-old Natalie was engaged to actor Robert Wagner, who was eight years in her senior, they couldn't get enough of this couple. 
They were married in 1957, and they were soon the favorite subject of gossip columns and fan magazines. The marriage would not last, and the couple divorced in 1962. But what Natalie's fans did not know was that even though she went through years of therapy, she was falling into a deep depression. She still put on a happy face for her fans, but inside, she was crumbling. In 1966, Natalie attempted to take her own life through a drug overdose. After being hospitalized, Natalie decided to take a break from making movies to address her mental health issues. It was during this break that she began a relationship with a man named Richard Gregson, who was a writer and a producer. The couple married in 1969, and the following year they welcomed their first child, who they named Natasha. About a year after Natasha's birth, Natalie filed for a divorce. It became final on April 12, 1972, and after a very short relationship with a future governor of California, Natalie reconciled with Robert Wagner. The couple seemed very happy together, and Natalie was overjoyed with spending time with her growing family versus making movies. The couple welcomed their only child together who they named Courtney in 1974. But it was soon afterwards that Natalie did go back to work. She worked on both the big and small screens, and in 1981, she began working on what would be her final film called Brainstorm with actor Christopher Walken. Now, before we talk about the circumstances surrounding Natalie's death, we need to go back in time to discuss Maria's trip to a fortune teller. One of the reasons that Maria was so determined that her daughter would be a star was due to a premonition that she received from a fortune teller when she was a child. According to Natalie's sister, Lana, while Maria was visiting China when she was young, she visited a psychic. This psychic told her that her daughter would be a great beauty and achieve massive fame. But this child needed to stay away from dark water, since this is how she would die. Maria would tell both of her daughters this story over and over, and it would terrify young Natalie so much that she never wanted to learn how to swim. In fact, Natalie's phobia towards water was so bad that she was fearful to even get into her own swimming pool, and she was afraid to wash her own hair. This phobia only worsened after having an old bridge collapse while she was filming the movie The Green Promise when she was about 10 years old. The incident left her with a broken wrist and reoccurring nightmares about drowning. When taping the movie Brainstorm, Natalie and her co-star Christopher Walken became fast friends. But rumors on the set was that the two were actually involved. This was because those on set felt a chemistry between the two. Did Robert hear about these rumors? Well, we actually do not know for sure, but it is rumored that Natalie and Robert's relationship was a bit rocky at this time. It was here that the couple invited Christopher to join them on a trip on their yacht, the Splendor. They planned to travel around Catalina Island, which is the southernmost island of the California's Channel Islands, located about 22 miles or 35.4 kilometers away from Los Angeles. Natalie and Robert had actually invited multiple friends to join them, but everyone but Christopher declined, citing less than ideal sailing weather for that weekend they planned to go. Joining Robert, Natalie and Christopher on the Splendor was the captain of the yacht, Dennis Daverin. On November 28, 1981, Natalie, Robert, Christopher and Dennis went to a Catalina restaurant called Doug's Harbor Reef to have a champagne-filled dinner. The four drank so much that night that the night manager of the restaurant would later say he was scared that they were all too intoxicated to take their dinghy back to the yacht themselves. At 10.30 p.m. that evening, the manager called Harbor Patrol to ensure the group got back to the Splendor safely. Back on the boat, the group continued to drink and talk, but soon Robert and Christopher's conversation started to get a bit heated. Natalie told the men that she was going to bed and left the men to their loud discussion. At about 11.05 p.m., those on board realized that Natalie was not in bed. They began to search the yacht to discover that the boat's dinghy was also gone. At about 1.30 a.m. on November 29th, a ship-to-shore call was made concerning Natalie's disappearance, but for some unknown reason, the Coast Guard was not contacted until 3.30 a.m., 
This was four and a half hours after the starlet, who couldn't swim, had gone missing. Natalie's body was later discovered in water about one mile or 1.6 kilometers away from the Splendor in an isolated cove called Blue Cavern Point. She was wearing a nightgown, socks, and a red down jacket. The Splendor's dinghy was found washed up on rocks a short distance south. The ignition was off, the gearing was in neutral, and the oars were locked, which made investigators think that Natalie likely never started the dinghy. Natalie's body was brought to the Los Angeles Medical Examiner's Office for autopsy. The first thing that was discovered was that the actress had a blood alcohol content of 0.14% at the time of her death, and to be legally drunk, one would have to have a blood alcohol concentration of over 0.08%. With Natalie's blood alcohol level, combined with the bruising on her arms, legs, and face, the deputy medical examiner believed that all of this was consistent with an accidental fall overboard while Natalie was trying to board the dinghy. Due to this, her death was ruled to be an accident. But was it? On November 17, 2011, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department reopened their case into Natalie's death after saying they received additional information from unidentified sources who contacted the authorities. The following day, the Splendor's captain, Dennis Daverin, was interviewed by the NBC show Today. In this interview, Dennis claimed that he lied about Natalie's death when he was originally questioned by the police. Then, he dropped a bombshell when he claimed that the well-known actor and Natalie's husband, Robert Wagner, was responsible for Natalie's death. He claimed that Natalie had become infatuated with Christopher during filming, and Robert was well aware. His jealousy was so bad that Dennis claimed that Robert would fly out to see Natalie on set to see if Christopher and Natalie were making a fool of him in front of their colleagues. He then claimed that Robert and Natalie were fighting all weekend, and it started to get so bad that he asked Christopher to intervene. But Christopher would not, due to he believed that a person should not get in the middle of a fighting couple. On the Friday night, Dennis claimed that he took Natalie to shore in the yacht's dinghy. The two got a room at the Pavilion Lodge Hotel, where they drank wine before they went to sleep. The next morning, Dennis and Natalie returned to the Splendor, and Natalie decided to stay the rest of the weekend on the boat since Christopher wanted to stay there. That afternoon, Dennis claimed that Natalie and Christopher went to Doug's Harbor Reef to drink, and Dennis and Robert joined the two later. The group drank a large amount of alcohol with dinner, but Natalie actually didn't eat very much. During this dinner, Dennis claimed that Christopher and Natalie were flirting up a storm. Could this be the reason that Robert and Natalie were supposedly fighting? On January 14, 2013, the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department announced that they were changing Natalie's cause of death from accidental drowning to drowning and other undetermined factors. And in the next few weeks, Robert was named as a person of interest in his wife's death. But by May of 2022, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office made another announcement. Robert Wagner was cleared in their investigation, and all leads in this case were exhausted. This case was now cold, and it remains open to this day. So what really happened to Natalie Wood? Well, there are several theories, and the first is that Natalie actually did accidentally drown. This theory was only solidified when on September 1st, 1997, Christopher Walken broke his silence about the night of Natalie's death when he was being interviewed by Playboy magazine. As per The Hollywood Reporter, Christopher said in this interview, Anybody there saw the logistics of the boat, the night, where we were, that it was raining, and would know exactly what happened. You hear about things happening to people. They slip in the bathtub, fall down the stairs, step off the curb in London because they think the cars come the other way, and they die. You feel you want to die making an effort at something. You don't want to die in some unnecessary way. What happened that night? Only she knows, because she was alone. She had gone to bed before us, and her room was at the back. A dinghy was bouncing against the side of the boat, and I think she went out to move it. There was a ski ramp that was partially in the water, it was slippery. I had walked on it myself. She had told me she couldn't swim. In fact, they had to cut a swimming scene from Brainstorm. She was probably half asleep, and she was wearing a coat. Could it be that Natalie couldn't sleep due to hearing the dinghy hitting the side of the yacht, put a coat on, and she went out to secure it? 
did she then slip on the ramp, fall into the water, and was pulled under due to her lack of swimming ability and the heavy weight of her waterlogged coat? Fingernail scratches were found on the side of the dinghy, and this made investigators believe that Natalie tried to climb back in but could not. In this theory, it's believed that Natalie clung to the side of the boat as it drifted away from the yacht, and she died after hypothermia and exhaustion led to her drowning. But if this was true, why did Robert, Christopher, and Dennis not hear her cry out for help? According to a witness from Harbor Patrol, they claimed they heard Natalie scream about something while she was boarding the Splendor that night, and they assumed it was nothing since they believed she was drunk. Later that night, John Payne and his girlfriend Marilyn Wayne heard shouting around midnight while they were sleeping on their boat that was near the Splendor. John would claim that he heard a woman screaming, Help me! Someone! Please help me! He then heard a voice of a man who sounded very drunk responding by saying, Okay, honey, we'll get you, in a mocking tone. This is why he and Marilyn presumed that these voices came from a nearby boat that had a party on board. And this brings us to our next theory, which is what Dennis claimed. Robert Wagner was involved with his wife's death. But as with the other theory, there are problems with this one too. Firstly, Dennis is considered to be a very unreliable witness. This was because he claimed he lied to police and it took him years to come forward with what he says is the truth. He also gave his truth in tiny little pieces to the tabloids for a payday. But the thing is that Dennis's version of events does line up with the testimonies of the other witnesses and with the evidence that was found. Some of that evidence was that when Natalie was discovered to be missing, Dennis claimed that he wanted to turn on the boat's lights and engine to start searching for Natalie but Robert would not allow him. Dennis claimed that Robert did not want to alert people nearby since he told him that he thought that something malicious may have occurred since Natalie would not have gone ashore alone. Then came the 2012 report concerning Natalie's autopsy. In the new report, it stated that the location and amount of bruising, lack of head trauma or facial bruising supported that Natalie was injured before she entered the water. Could it be that Robert was jealous of Natalie's relationship with Christopher and that caused them to fight that weekend? During that fight, could Robert have gotten violent and hurt his wife before he put her in the water? Now, according to Natalie's sister, Lana Wood, this is what she believes actually happened that night. As she told the New York Post, she does not believe that Natalie's death was premeditated, but she does believe that Robert was responsible. She believes that something happened between Natalie and Robert when they were drinking and fighting, and this resulted in Natalie's death. But remember this, my spooky friends. After this case was reopened, Robert was cleared of any wrongdoing. This doesn't mean that he doesn't feel personally responsible, though. In fact, Robert has publicly stated that he does feel responsible because he didn't notice sooner that his wife was missing. But in the end, there will always be a sense of mystery surrounding this case, and we will probably never know what happened to the woman who dominated the silver screen since she was a child. Thank you all for joining me for our latest episode of Horrifying History. Join us on Facebook at Horrifying History, on Instagram at Horrifying underscore History, on Twitter at Horrifying H-I-S-T-1, or reach out to us by email at HorrifyingHistory at Outlook.com and tell us, do you think that Natalie Wood's death was a horrible accident, or perhaps was it something more? Now, if you haven't done it yet, please remember to hit the subscribe button for this podcast. For when you do, not only do you let more people know about our show, but you download our next episode on its day of release. It's a great way not to miss our next episode, The Last of the Vampires. If you would love to take home a piece of horrifying history, you need to check out our store. You'll find some great items by going to redbubble.com and by searching for horrifying history in their search box. And if you want to get a bunch of really great perks like ad-free episodes, free merchandise, additional content, and much, much more, we're now on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash horrifying history to sign up today. Thank you all for listening. And until next time...